subsidies distribution increase among measures identified for rice supply issue. Applications for foreign workers in three subsectors open on 10th October. Good evening and Salam Malaysia Madani. Thanks for joining us. I'm Otto Othman and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim has agreed to implement four additional intervention measures to overcome the rice supply issue in the country. Now, these included directing the Federal Agricultural Marketing Authority, or FAMA, to increase the distribution of local white rice in rural areas, including sundry shops. Agriculture and Food Security Minister Datuk Sri Muhammad Sabu said the government will bear the transportation cost through FAMA as the sales margin of local white rice is only 50 cent per kilograms of rice. He said that for Sabah and Sarawak, the government agreed to give a subsidy of 950 ringgit per ton for imported white rice or BPI beginning 5th October. Melalui kaedah ini, Harga runcit beras putih import di kedua-dua negeri ini akan menjadi RM31 bagi kampit 10 gram. Langkah ini diambil uh, 10 kilogram. Langkah ini diambil memandangkan pengeluaran beras putih tempatan di Sabah dan Sarawak adalah terlalu terhad. The minister also said all suppliers will be using local rice by obtaining supplies at a wholesale price of 3,200 ringgit in 50 kilogram bags, subject to conditions and regulations that have been set. Meanwhile, the ministry today launched the Special Integrated Task Force on White Rice Operations Enforcement, or OPBPT. He said this op BPT will involve the Kawasilia Padi Dan Bras KPB regulatory body, domestic trade and cost of living enforcement authorities, police, Malaysian World Customs Department and Malaysian Quarantine and Inspection Service Department. Op bersatu ini akan diketuai oleh Tuan Chan Fong Hin, Timbalan Menteri Pertanian dan Keterjaminan Makanan. Melalui op bersatu ini, Kita akan membuat pemeriksaan menyeluruh ke atas rantaian industri termasuk semua kilang-kilang besar dan stok-stok pemborong beras mulai esok. Sampel beras juga akan diambil di semua kilang beras di gudang-gudang pemborong dan juga di pasaraya untuk dibuat analisis kimia. The minister also reminded the public to keep calm and buy rice according to their needs. Schools are encouraged to follow the guideline gazetted by the Education Ministry following the current haze phenomenon in the country. Now, its Minister Fadli Naside explained that the guideline, among others, prohibit any outdoor activities if the Air Pollution Index API exceeds 100. She added that the Ministry will act upon advice by the Health Ministry on whether it is necessary to close schools in the affected areas. Uh, maknanya kalau IPU lebih daripada uh, 100, tiada aktiviti luar boleh dilaksanakan dan ikut garis panduan tersebut. Ya. Uh, sebagaimana yang sering kita tegaskan, garis panduan ini terpakai uh, kepada semua dan uh, mesti dipatuhi untuk mengelakkan sebarang kejadian yang tidak diingini. The number of areas recorded with unhealthy air pollutant index increased to 16 in nine states, with Chiras recorded the most unhealthy rating at 164. The lack of integrity and self-interest are believed to be the motives of five policemen arrested in connection with the alleged abduction of a man from a restaurant in Desipatani last week. Kuala Lumpur Police Chief Dato Alauddin Abdul Majid said the police are, had already completed the investigation papers related to the case and were awaiting instructions from Bukiraman before handing it over to the Deputy Public Prosecutor's Office. Kita telah pun jalankan siasatan. Uh, kita akan uh, siasatan telah selesai so mandangkan yang melibatkan pegawai polis kita akan angkat ke keaman dan seterusnya rujuk kepada timbalan pendakwa raya jadi siasatan dah selesai dah He said the five policemen had not yet been suspended as action would only be taken if they were charged in court 
Last Friday, it was reported that five policemen were among six individuals arrested after a man lodged a report claiming that he was abducted by a group of men from a restaurant before being beaten up at another location in Kuala Lumpur. The suspects, aged between 27 and 42, were arrested, with five of them being personnel from the Chiras Police Headquarters. The bilateral ties between Malaysia and New Zealand are now stronger than ever, and this is mainly because they understand each other's economic needs and sensitivities. Yang Diputuan Agong Al-Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al-Mustafa Billah Shah said the strong ties were evident from the visits made by leaders from both countries since last year. His Majesty said his exchange of visits have paved the way for closer cooperation related to the economic and halal sectors, as well as the empowerment of indigenous communities. Malaysia and New Zealand have enjoyed robust growth in trade relations, and in 2022, New Zealand remained among Malaysia's top three trading partners in the Pacific region. Malaysia, according to His Majesty, would continue to extend a warm welcome to all visitors from New Zealand. Al-Sultan Abdullah said this at a state banquet in honor of the Governor-General of New Zealand, Dame Cindy Kiro, and her delegation at Istana Negara today. Al-Sultan Abdullah said he was elated by the state visit by Kiro, describing it as a sign of the existing close ties between the two countries. It is hoped that this state visit will further strengthen the friendship and bilateral ties between Malaysia and New Zealand. In our foreign segment, Ukraine claims that U.S. support has not wavered. Ukraine's top diplomat on Monday said Washington's support for Kyiv was not wavering and played down the significance of a stopgap funding bill passed by United States Congress that omitted aid to Ukraine. Ukraine respects the U.S. and other Western military assistance have been vital for Ukraine to fight back against the full-scale invasion launched by Russia in February 2022. Ukraine Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said Kyiv was in talks with Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. Congress and that the drama around the stopgap bill that averted the government shutdown on Saturday was an quote-unquote incident rather than something systemic. Kuleba said the question was whether what happened in the U.S. Congress at the weekend was, quote-unquote, an incident or a system. Kuleba spoke alongside European Union foreign policy Joseph Borrell as for the first time. European Union foreign ministers are meeting outside the bloc's own borders in Ukraine. The United States House of Representatives struck a deal to fund the government for another 45 days so as to avert a government shutdown. The bill went next to the Senate, which uh, was meeting late in the evening, hours to go before the midnight deadline to fund the government. The bill would keep the government open for another 45 days if signed into law by President Joe Biden. The package would leave behind aid to Ukraine but increase federal disaster assistance. The U.S. government started notifying federal workers on Thursday that a government shutdown, the 22nd since 1976, seems to be imminent. In a government's shutdown, all non-essential operations will be suspended and many federal workers will be furloughed. It is not uncommon for the U.S. federal government to halt its operations due to political fights between the two parties. The longest government shutdown occurred from late 2018 to early 2019 when Democrats opposed funding for the U.S.-Mexico border wall proposed by the then-President Donald Trump, and the two parties were stuck in a stalemate over immigration issues leading to a five-week shutdown. Australia's southeast on Sunday sweltered in a heat wave that raised the risk of bushfires and prompted authorities to issue fire bans for large swaths of New South Wales state. The nation's weather forecasters said temperatures would be up to 12 degrees Celsius, above average in some areas with Sydney, capital of Australia's most populous state, New South Wales, set to hit 36 degrees Celsius. Australia faces a high-risk bushfire season as it experiences an El Nino weather event recently announced, which is typically associated with extreme events like wildfires, cyclones and droughts. 
Fire authorities said hot and dry conditions along with wind combined are the perfect storm for the fire to run through. State Emergency Services Minister Jihad Dib said the scorching heat lifted the risk for bushfires in the week ahead. Fire authorities on Sunday issued nine fire total bans for parts of the state in a bid to reduce the chance of bushfires. Coming up in sports, collective wins in Asian Games badminton camp to advance into second round. National men's singles shuttler Li Zijia made up for his failure at the team event last week for by eliminating Hong Kong's Angus Ng Ka Long in the opening round of the individual event at the 2022 Hangzhou Asian Games. Now, however, the 25-year-old former All England champion had to slog for over an hour as he bounced back from a first-game deficit to beat Angus at the Beijing Gymnasium. The 16th-ranked Malaysian had a shaky start as he lost the first set, 15-21. Zijia, however, bucked up and came back with more energetic effort to take the two later sets, 21-15, 21-16, in convincing fashion. The All-England champion will next take on Timor-Leste's Marinho Guzmao de Jesus in the second round. Meanwhile, Malaysian men's doubles pair Aaron Chia So Wu Yik also had to huff and puff for 90 minutes before subduing the Taiwanese pair of Lu Ching Yao, Yang Po Han, 21 23, 21 13, 23 21 in their first round match. The duo will face Thailand's Supak Jomko, Supi Sara Pao Sampran in round two. Also booking their spot in round two were mixed doubles pair of Chen Tangji, To Yi Wei, who outplayed Singapore's Andy Jun Liang Kwek, Crystal Wong Jian Ying, 21-17, 21-13 in just 40 minutes. To Anfield legends Bobby Firmino and Jordan Henderson were reunited as they face off in the Saudi Pro League on Saturday. However, they played a goalless draw all the way to the final whistle after Roberto Firmino's goal was disallowed. The ex-Liverpool player produced a one-touch finish from the edge of the box into the bottom corner early into the first half, but the goal was ruled out for offside. Al Etifak's Moussa Dembele had several key chances in front of the goal, including one effort tipped over the bar by Al Ahli goalkeeper Edward Mendy, but could not convert them. Al Etifak are fifth in the table, while Al Ahli are close behind in sixth. Al Hilal are the current league leaders with just four points, separating first and sixth place. Firmino, whose contract had expired with Jurgen Klopp's side, joined Al Ahli in the summer, while former captain Henderson moved to seven Gerard's Al Etifak in a deal worth 12 million euros. Now on to motorsports, the MotoGP. Primark Racing's Jorge Martin was declared the winner of the Japanese Grand Prix when it was red flagged halfway through the race on Sunday due to torrential rain. Martin was in the lead with Ducati's championship leader Francesco Bagnaia in second, while Honda's Marc Marquez was third. The result meant Bagnaglia retains a slim lead in the Riders' Championship, but Martin has now cut the gap to just three points. Riders had a nervy start when the rain began falling just as the race began. Race directors waved the white flag allowing riders to swap their bikes and almost everyone came in except the Yamahas. But the Yamahas eventually came in as conditions deteriorated, which allowed Honda's Marquez to move up the field and sit second behind Aprilia's Alexi Espargaro, while Banyaya was third. Once the riders got to grips with the wet track, Marquez fell behind as Banyaya and Martin went through into podium positions. After an early error, Martin sliced through the pack and he soon overtook both Banyaya and Espargaro on the same lap before pulling clear in the lead, while championship contender Marco Bezzecchi overcame a slow start to move up to third. However, Marquez improved when conditions worsened and he reeled in Bezzecchi before moving off the race line to overtake the Italian VR46 racing rider, much to the delight of local fans in Honda's backyard. 
Uh, Tanak avoided any final day mishaps to clinch the rally of Chile on Sunday as Kelly Rovenpera's title celebrations were put on hold. Defending world champion Rovenpera arrived in South America with a 33-point lead over Elvin Evans and aiming to wrap up the title. But the Toyota driver had to put the champagne on ice after only finishing fourth with his teammate Evans in third. <laughs> The duo had no answer to 2019's champion Tanak over the three days around Conception. The M Sport Ford driver sweeping into the lead on Friday thanks to astute tire choice. Estonian Tanak won four of Saturday's stages to cement his lead, which he held on to despite Terry Newville winning three stages and Roven Pera, the power stage, and with it, an additional five precious points on Sunday. Tanak claimed his second win of the season and 19th of his career, the time advantage over Nouvelle of 42 seconds. Evans was one minute, seven seconds back. Evans goes into the final two rallies, 31 points shy of Robin Pera in the driver's standings, with the constructors' crown having been won in Chile by their team Toyota. The final two rounds of the World Championship are the Central European Rally, a new addition to the calendar in Austria, Czech Republic and Germany in late October, with Japan hosting the 13th and final leg in November. Pop megastar Taylor Swift traveled to New Jersey on Sunday to watch Travis Kells and his Kansas City Chiefs take on the New York Jets as rumors about the pair's relationship sent the National Football League's ticket sales and television viewership soaring. Swift was seen in a luxury box with several other celebrities, including Hollywood actors Ryan Reynolds, Hugh Jackman and Blake Lively. As the Chiefs score the first touchdown of the game, running back Isaiah Pacheco, not Kels, crossed the goal line. Swift was seen celebrating in the suit. According to ticket resale platform StubHub, Jets ticket sales for their game against the Chiefs soared after Swift's appearance at the Chiefs' last game, with sales in the single day more than doubling the previous record for this season. StubHub also said Sunday's game was the second highest selling game of the NFL season after the season opener. The cheapest nosebleed seat tickets for Sunday's game in East Rutherford, New Jersey, were going for 81 US dollars on Sunday afternoon, while resale tickets at the lower level cost close to $9,000. In our business segment, government to assure EV ownership available to all income groups. Applications for foreign workers in the three subsectors involving barber shops, textiles, and goldsmiths will be opened on 10th October. Human Resources Minister V. Siva Kumar said the application will run until the 7,500 quota of foreign workers allocated for the subsectors is reached. Siva Kumar said the application can be done by employers registered with Indian Commerce Association. Dan permohonan ini dibuka sehingga kota yang ditetapkan oleh kerajaan telah dipenuhi bagi tiga subsektor ini sehingga tujuh ribu lima ratus diangkat semuanya. Okay, jadi kalau dalam tiga hari habis habislah bagi pekerja sedia ada. Okay, bagi pekerja yang sedia ada permohonan pembaharuan pas lawatan kerja sementara PLKS. Boleh dibuat oleh majikan bagi pekerja di bawah kategori ini bermula 10 Oktober 2023 pada hari yang sama juga. Siva Kumar said the approval of the employment will be subjected to the existing business operations only. Stakeholders in the oil palm industry must work collectively towards sustaining the prosperity of the critis, critical facets of the industry. Now, Deputy Prime Minister Dato Sri Faluna Yusuf said the industry players must acknowledge the challenges of navigating the global agricultural landscape, adding removing palm oil from global food supply would have devastating consequences for the industry and the world at large. Datuk Sri Fadilah, who is also Plantation and Commodities Minister, said over the years, Malaysia's oil palm industry has played a transformative role in establishing the country as a global leader in the edible oil markets, while bolstering the national economy. 
As of December 2022, oil palm planted in Malaysia stands at 5.67 million hectares and the yield accounts for approximately 18% of the world's exports of edible oils and fats. Here, I want to emphasize that industries sustain growth and competitiveness even in the face of social and environmental concerns is laudable. Our country remains com committed to confronting discriminatory trade practices aimed at undermining this essential agricultural commodity. As such, we'll continue our efforts to engage with the European Union and other stakeholders following the implementation of the European Union Deforestation Regulation, or better known as EUDR, to protect our industry. Dato Sri Fadila was speaking at the National Palm Oil Conference 2023, which commenced today. During the event, the Malaysian Palm Oil Association, or MPOA, unveiled its responsible recruitment guideline on the recruitment of foreign workers. The government will ensure that electric vehicles or EV ownership is available to all income groups through targeted subsidies and financial assistance. At the same time, the government is also ramping up efforts to expand and enhance the country's EV charging infrastructure. According to Investment, Trade and Industry Minister Tengku Datuk Sri Zafrul Tengku Abdul Aziz, the implementation of policies and initiatives has had a positive impact on the local automotive industry, reflecting the government's commitment to developing a holistic EV ecosystem in the country. The number of registered EVs exceeded 7,500 units by September 2023, compared to an average of 300 units in previous years. Furthermore, investments in EV industry in the country have reached an impressive 26.2 billion ringgit from 2018 up to March this year. The minister said this at the launch of the Tesla Center in Cyberjaya today. Tengku Dato Sri Zafrol said Tesla's presence in Malaysia will enhance the EV ecosystem and boost the nation's potential as a regional EV production hub, which could attract further investments in the sector. With Tesla's presence, Malaysia is ready to expedite the transition to EVs and the nation is set to see a surge in technological advancements, research and development in the EV sector. Malaysia has recorded overall export sales worth 625.42 million ringgit at the recently concluded 20th China ASEAN Expo or Kai Expo 2023 in Nanning, China. Now, according to the Malaysian External Trade and Development Corporation, MaTrade, the recorded export sales were in the food and beverage, healthcare and wellness, lifestyle products and services sector. A total of 107 Malaysian companies and nine other government agencies participated, with 116 booths at the Kai Expo 2023, held from 16th to 19th September. As a result of Matrade's strategies and proactive efforts, including in arranging impactful activities and business meetings, Malaysia's participation in Kai Expo has secured significant value of export sales and business partnerships. Matrade said the continued sourcing by the Chinese buyers demonstrated the quality, resilience and competitiveness of Malaysian products and services, rolling on the growth of momentum of the trade dealings between Malaysia and China at the Ka Expo for the past 20 years. From 2004 to 2022, Malaysia's trade with China expanded by almost sixfold. The World Bank today projected, you know, projected Malaysia's economic growth to moderate to 3.9% in 2023 from an earlier projection of 4.3% in April of this year amid substantial deceleration of external demand. However, it said domestic demand would continue to support Malaysia's economic resilience this year while limited fiscal space remained a key challenge for the economy. World Bank lead economist Apurva Sanghi pointed out that the reason for the lower 0.4 percentage points lower than previous forecasts was due to weak external demand. He also said that Malaysia was sensitive to changes in external demand, especially regarding the country's largest trading partners, namely the United States and China. 
The World Bank estimated that a one percentage point fall in the U.S. growth rate could reduce Malaysia's economic growth by 0.82 percentage points and a 1.0 percentage point fall in China's GDP growth rate could drag Malaysia's GDP by 0.45 percentage points. However, Malaysia's growth was also affected by domestic factors, including the base effect from high growth last year and extreme weather events, which have affected agriculture output earlier this year. Apurva noted that Malaysia's economic growth has surpassed the pre-pandemic level, and the country's economy is projected to grow to 4.3% in 2024. Investment analysts maintained a positive stance on the banking sector with industry loan growth on track to end 2023 at 4.0% to 4.5%. Kananga Research today anticipated loans to be supported by a resilient mortgage supply with a growing take-up of affordable housing. Kananga said system loans grew by 4.2% year-on-year in August 2023, with household loans remaining dominant at 5.5%. On the other hand, business loans are holding up with support from service industries. On a month-on-month -month basis, Kananga Research said both household and business loans grew by 0.7% as flattish overnight policy rate OPR expectations have eased concerns on interest pressures and returned overall appetite to undertake loans. It said net interest margins are due for stabilization, with 2024 likely to see expansion from 2023's just recovering base. Meanwhile, Maybank Investment Bank Burhad, Maybank IB, said loan applications are expanding again, having contracted over the past two months. RHB Research said the banking system remains healthy with sufficient capital buffer as liquidity is ample, with a loan-to-deposit ratio at 86.1% and liquidity coverage ratio at high 149%. BMI has maintained its 2023 forecast for Malaysia's federal government budget deficit at 4.9% of gross domestic product or GDP from 5.6% in 2022. In a report published today, the Fitch Solutions Unit said that the forecast is slightly above the government's projection, which forecasts a deficit of 5.0%. It said up till the first half of 2023, the federal government's revenue and expenditure have trended closely to the projections stipulated at the start of the year. And on this trajectory, the government is on track to achieve its target. Meanwhile, BMI also forecasts revenue growth to slow marginally to 15.3% of GDP in 2023, from 16.5% of GDP in 2022, due to the reduction in income tax payable for certain income brackets. As of first half of 2023, the federal government's revenue collection stood at 148.4 billion ringgit, or 51.1% of the prevailing target for 2023, and sits above the five-year average of 47.8%. Additionally, BMI said as of June 2023, total federal government debt of 1,145 billion ringgit or 60.6% of GDP is in line with their forecast. It also noted that the government has also laid out plans to bring down fiscal deficit gradually to 3.2% by the end of 2025, which would take the 2023-2025 average to 4.1% of GDP. Well, that concludes Malaysia Tonight this time around. In our top stories, subsidies, distribution increase among measures identified for the rice supply issue. Do tune in to World Today coming up tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. on TV2. You can also stream via RTM Mobile Click App. Until then, I'm Otto Othman, Malaysia Madani. Take up for Paduan Penuhi Harapan. Thank you for watching.